we're going to go straight into this third panel. Um, uh, uh, Tom, a few minutes ago, told me that it's time we take it down a notch, which I interpreted as him saying that the IQ of people in this room isn't high enough, so we need to kind of reduce the level of, uh, but what he meant was, I think, more implementation uh, issues. So, Tom, we are going to take it down a notch with this collection of eminences. Um, on my immediate right is uh, Jackie Baba, who's a dear friend. She's a human rights lawyer and uh, does a lot of work on gender and opportunity, equality of opportunity, uh, in different societies, including India. Um, to her right is Stieg, who I just met, but it turns out we went to the same school a while back, and he runs an a educational nonprofit in Boston, which has several charter schools that he's going to talk about for poor kids, and also an accredited, fully accredited uh, graduate school of education that trains teachers, um, also for the poor kids, I assume, Stieg, yes. yes? Correct. I don't know whether he's going to get a chance to talk about the grad school, but uh, it's important that we know that. Uh, and to his right is uh, Tom, who is from the Central Square Foundation, has a long career, many long careers, uh, but is instrumental really in, with Ashish, pulling this together. And uh, the South Asian Institute is just the agent to operationalize what Ashish and Tom and his colleagues want to do. Um, so with your permission, I'm going to sit down there so I can see them all, because I have nothing to say here. So I'll What's just... What's the order? Um, Tom's going to go first, then uh, Jackie and Steve. Work Great. for you? That's yeah. Perfect. So let me jump in. Um, first I, of all, I will interrupt if you go more than eight, nine minutes. Okay, great. I'll take off my watch so I can see it. Okay. Right, um, first, I um, just want to say thank you to the people here for, um, for engaging in this conversation. It's, it's really um, important and useful for us as we map uh, the future for Central Square Foundation. So it's really um, it's a privilege to have this chance. I feel um, somewhat like the blind <coughs> zookeeper trying to find the front end of the elephant. Um, it's, it's an enormous undertaking to unabashedly uh, position oneself as, a, as an institution um, to support 240 odd million children um, in the Indian educational K through 12 system. Uh, my, my early remarks this afternoon are these. Um, I'm fascinated by big social challenges. I'm not an economist. I'm not an educator. Um, and I'm not sure where my generalist skills will fit into this conversation, but let me provide them to you. Um, this, is, this is a chance to hear from, from, from this panel about the United States, uh, which has been a stupendous support of us in our learning about the 25 plus year ed reform movement in this country. Um, and Jackie will bring us, as I said to Torn, down into the weeds with some very specific um, perspectives on a program uh, supporting disadvantaged children in India. Um, the, 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 the way I see it is this. Um, from a US point of view, if one looks over these last you know, 25 odd years, um, a lot of incredible things have come into the US ed reform movement that we can and want to bring to India. Um, the first and most important is leadership. Um, there was a healthy discussion earlier about teachers and principals. Um, when one looks at Teach for America and the pipeline of talent that that is pumped and the energy that is pumped into the system here in the United States, it's an amazing accomplishment. So as we look to bring that energy through Teach for India and other places, we see an enormous um, uh, chance. Um, standards and assessments. Um, so much of Kartik's commentary, the discussion of the panel that preceded this one, speaks to measuring learning outcomes. Thank goodness that vocabulary is now in the lexicon of ed reform discussions in India. But nonetheless, we are still at a place of not really understanding where the kids are. And if there's a 70% dropout rate from the beginning of a, of a child's education to getting to the end of the 12th grade, we have a problem. Um, Early childhood development in the United States has bumped and started, but again, there's clear evidence from the experiences here in this country um, that we can and should be doing more there. Special needs children, marginalized children. Um, at the end of the day, <coughs> we are um, learning all the time about how our brains work, and so there's an enormous amount to gain from that. A point that isn't much talked about, and it may be too obscure for the conversation we're going to have today, is incentives. Um, one of the great things that has sort of evolved in the current administration here in this country are things like Race to the Top and I-3. And more than anything, you're seeing de minimis sums of money serve as a catalyst for state-led reform, state-led creativity. And my closing point on this policy schmear that I'm putting forward is that a balance needs to be reached between providing things that enable the entrepreneurs who are working um, in the ground, the government bureaucracies that are working on the ground um, to, make some sen uh, to make progress without too much micromanagement, which destroys and, 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 and encumbers the ability to go forward. 
Um, I'll now switch my focus to this um, internal external framing that we heard in the last panel. I don't think as an institution, Central Square Foundation can afford to be one or the other. Um, I think the system is so large and so complex that we need to push ourselves to work both in the government system as well as outside of the government system. Again, for context, if we look at the United States, a very, very small amount of, of, the, of the total school age population are engaged in charter schools. And within the charter school system, which I'm defining as being outside of the system, um, half are doing really good stuff and half are doing not so good stuff. So there's not a whole lot of information in the broad measure. But I think what we have to recognize is that, that, that experimentation, that opportunity to create innovation and insights is, is really, really important. And I'm also interested in watching market signals. That's my economics term for the day. If 75% of the families in Bombay are sending their children to affordable private schools, if 50% of the families in Delhi are sending their children to affordable private schools, if 25 to 30% of the families in rural India are sending their children to private schools, this non-government system is important and it's winning. So we have to find some ways of being better able to study it. Um, so let me wrap up. Um, we're trying to do something pretty important in India. We recognize that we can't do it alone. One of the most important elements of this larger conversation is help us figure out the way forward and what to do. Do we focus on small pockets of excellence? Do we try to create modest, small change across a much larger uh, piece of, of, of the curve? Do we focus on bringing lousy schools to being mediocre schools? Do we focus on bringing mediocre schools to good or good to great? These are the kinds of questions that we're wrestling with. And as we think about the research that's been done, the research that needs to be done, the lessons we can learn from the United States, the lessons we can learn from China and other countries, um, we're looking for help in addressing those kinds of questions. Thank you um, to the organizers and to all of you for staying. Um, I want to make a couple of preliminary comments and then quickly take you through quickly through six slides. My cr preliminary comments are that I think the discussion we've had so far um, has highlighted something which we haven't spoken about, which is the enormous mismatch in power and um, political um, agency between adults and children. And when we talk about schools and education, I don't think we can avoid that. We talk about the power that adults have over children without talking about the impact that children might want to have on their education without thinking about what it feels like. So one of the previous panelists said that, um, you know, there's, uh, in fact, several said that there's no evidence that the environment, that the infrastructure makes a difference to learning outcomes. Maybe that would be true for us too. We could sit in a dark, moldy office at Harvard, freezing cold in the winter and boiling hot in the summer. We might still produce the same number of, of um, of kind of peer review articles. Is that a reason for sort of looking at that? Is, is the outcome metric always what has to primarily drive the way we make decisions? Aren't we talking about an enabling environment which promotes a sense of well-being? And why, why isn't that part of this metric? It really bothers me, that sort of very mechanistic discussion. And particularly if we're talking about, Tarun just said thank you to all of you for staying in this stuffy Ellis room. You know, we've been here for what, an hour and a half and two hours, and he's rightly thanking us. Imagine spending six or eight hours a day in a school where, the, where it's, it's dirty, where it's boiling hot often in India, or sometimes freezing cold, um, you know, where the light is poor, where it's dusty. I mean, those things are important, even if they don't have an impact on the grades you get or the learning outcomes. So I really, there's something in me which is kind of repelled by that way of thinking about, about the point of education. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is that, and, and I think Fernando mentioned this, my presentation is really all about equity. It's about social justice within one of the most important institutions that our society has, which is school. We force parents to send children to school. It's, a, it's an obligation that parents have. A few parents, I guess, can, can opt out and homeschool, but that's a tiny minority. So if we force parents to do that, if we say this is a value in a society, then surely the equity question is central. We can't just look at outcomes for a certain proportion. We have to look at equity across the board. So really, our pres my presentation, and I say our because actually I'm part of a team and my colleague Ola Kelly is sitting in the audience and it's really 
a, a co-conspirator. Our, our project is really looking at equity, and in particular, we're focusing on gender, though we could have focused on caste, we could have focused on a range of, on disability, we could have focused on a range of other variables. But gender, I think, captures 50%, so that's a pretty good way to, to start the equity question. So, um, and I, the point's already been made, but I thought I would just uh, very quickly show you this slide. Let me just summarize it by saying that, um, that rural female population has just a little bit over half the education of the urban male population. That's a pretty severe indictment of an education system. And if you look at the rural female, if what we're seeing is that... Um, basically the mean drops out after five years of education. That's around puberty or maybe just before puberty. Uh, the Right to Education Act and, and, and the obligation in India, I think, goes from five or six to 14. So it turns out that the mean of rural girls are not complying with that. So that's something I think we need to take into account. And we know that there are many different uh, reasons for that. Some of them have already been, been spoken about. But I think this is a, a baseline we have to take into account. So, um, and this slide just shows, this is data from a project that we did together with SEVA, the Self-Employed Women's Association in five villages in Gujarat a couple of years ago, um, looking at uh, gender differences amongst children attending secondary school in, in a, a, a sort of um, desertified part of northwest Gujarat. Um, amongst, uh, in villages where SEVA had a very high membership. So these are villages where the mothers, many of the mothers are already mobilized. They, they are women who believe in women's rights. They're women who have had transformative life experiences. And yet, look at this, look at this graph, look at the difference between the boys and the girls. So nobody's doing that well, but the girls are doing dramatically worse. Um, and you know, again, multifaceted obstacles, both supply side and demand side. Um, and I'm just putting here one of my photographs, which I think illustrates a point made earlier, which is that, you know, you can have attempts to really address the gender <coughs> issue, girls' toilets, but, you know, if you don't invest in them in an ongoing way and make them usable, then it's just really an election, an election ga gambit and, and nothing much else. And I would submit that certainly m our experience in Gujarat suggests that every single single school has girls' toilets, and I think uh, the majority of them are like this, so they're unusable. Okay, so just fast-forwarding to our current project, Fernando already <coughs> mentioned the concept of positive deviance, uh, and just to reiterate, posit oops, positive deviance um, is an approach where instead of focusing on obstacles to the achievement of some good, you look at the success story in achieving that good, and you try to figure out what the triggers of that success are, so a simplified account. So our Champions Project is doing precisely that. We are looking um, at girls who we define as champions, who are girls in their second year of university, both of whose parents are illiterate, and asking how it is that they manage to get to university when most of their peers get nowhere near even finishing secondary school. So. Um, one of our questions was, to what extent does government help them? To what extent are the sort of rupee, gender education rupees actually making a difference? And our findings are not great. Um, and I won't spend too long on them, but happy to go back over them. But basically, it seems that... Um, Many, many of the, of the girls are not really getting much support um, from government schemes. And so this, this, even this group that's managed to get to college are not really being, being very well supported. Um, what we did find, and this in a way is a depressing finding, is that what really makes a difference are personal familial, familial factors and individual psychological resilience. In other words, the system is not really helping much. Uh, the system is really depending on, you know, courageous, brave parents to make the difference and girls who uh, manage to overcome the obstacles they encounter. And again, more to be said on that, but if you just look at the slides, you'll see that the light blue is where you get um, support for your education. As you go further away from the left axis, you get less and less than that. So you're really relying on your parents and on your siblings in order to be successful. And the, the community as a whole is not really doing much for you. Um, and this is, I think, my last slide. Um, and this is a very important slide for us. Because uh, one of the things that we were not expecting, maybe foolishly, but that we found is that 
harassment, sexual harassment, a sense of ill ease in the environment is a huge factor for even for the girls, the young women who've managed to get to college. And we ignore that factor at our peril. If you look here, you see that even in lower primary school, about um, you know, a non-trivial amount of kids have experienced harassment. And we, we ask them to say, have they ever had attention, somebody pressing, somebody touching them in a way that made them felt uncomfortable. So we sort of left some latitude. We didn't, you know, left it for the kids to, to, to interpret. And you'll see how many said they'd even encountered it there. And when you get up to lo upper secondary, so before they've, they've actually made the leap to college, you're finding that well over 30% of these young girls have experienced this. So um, given the amount of time you have to spend in the public sphere getting to school, um, this is a serious concern. Our data shows that the harassment comes both from teachers and from peers. So the environment as a whole is not perceived as safe. So just to, to, to wrap up, I would say that um, what our data shows so far, we've only done one of our studies in Maharashtra, so a small state of only about 60 million. Uh, we, we, we interviewed about, um, about 425 champions across the state. And what, we, what we're finding, therefore, is that government support is really not delivering as much as um, one would like. Um, and that uh, personal and uh, familial sacrifice and resilience seems to be doing most of the work. So I guess the conclusion, and we are hoping to do other similar studies in Rajasthan and UP and maybe elsewhere. Um, so my final point is that I think we do absolutely have to pay attention to factors which may not be directly related to learning outcomes. It would be a tragedy if having focused only on access, we now just focused only on learning and missed um, much broader questions about what school feels like to kids who are forced to spend you know, the best part of their days in it. Thank you. OK. I don't know how I end up going last today. Uh, I was confused like 10 minutes into this conference, and so here I am at the very end um, <laughs> trying to make sense of something. I think um, I'm just going to start by telling you guys what I do every day, um, and then I'll try to synthesize um, and take a leap towards some kind of caution or advice about India. Um, and I'll preview it for you, Ashish and Tom, as you get on the plane back. I think as you go about your work, the main thing I've extracted in 15 years of this over here is to strenuously separate and be self-aware about when you're thinking about an educational policy or practice problem versus when you're thinking very directly about the pathologies of government. Because I think that might be one of the truest things I've learned about it on this side of the Atlantic, but, or the equator, I suppose. But let me come to that. Here's what I do every day, folks. I, I work in an organization. We run a, um, a group of what I consider to be extraordinary uh, publicly funded charter schools in inner city Boston for poor kids. They're college prep schools. They're part of what I would consider 300 charter schools out of the 5,000 in this country that are truly making progress towards closing the achievement gap. Um, uh, and you guys can probably imagine these schools fairly quickly. They run on long days. Uh, we love our kids. We demand a lot of them. We're interested in producing kids who have two attributes. One is genuinely, kids who are genuinely academically ready. So these are kids who can pass AP calculus and read a complex history textbook. Um, and that takes us 14 years to get there. Um, and we're secondly interested in kids who have a psychology of effort. Um, this is our term for summing up all the non-cognitive factors that matter uh, in the long run outcomes for kids. Um, we do an enormous amount of work, not as educators, but as mentors and parents uh, of these children. Um, there's a whole body of social science research, by the way, bubbling up in this world. Ultimately, we're interested in livelihoods for our kids. Uh, we measure AP scores and college going and completion rates. Ultimately, what we're interested in for them is freedom. Um, and it's probably measured best um, and at the end of the line by economic mobility. Those are our schools. Um, by the way, uh, bureaucratically, we are profoundly deregulated. We get public funding, but we're free to pretty much do what we want. 
Um, secondly, at Match, we run a graduate school of education. It was approved four years ago. It was the first newly approved uh, graduate school of education in the state in the last 40 years. Uh, we're graduating 45 uh, master's degree candidates this year. We, are, we pass out something called the Masters of Effective Teaching um, and um, are in that body of work interested in this question we've been talking about today, which is what is a good teacher? Um, and um, we will produce 100 teachers a year, I think, which is about what the ed school does, though someone should correct me about that, and ultimately are applied social scientists on that problem as well as we are on the school design question, which is how do you train an effective novice teacher, and can we do genuine R&D work on that question out in the field? Um, and we're beginning to learn about that. I would characterize how much we know about teacher preparation to be much earlier stage than what we're beginning to learn over the last decade about school design. Um, we share a hypothesis that came up early in this, which is that uh, teacher preparation needs to focus very strongly on practice, not theory. I'll leave it at that, but there's a lot more beneath that. Uh, we train teachers very strenuously in our applied settings, and they go out and work in high poverty schools across the country. Um, and we have a third body of work that we do, which is essentially publishing and advocacy, which I won't talk about here. But that's what I do every day. Um, big picture, um, over the last 15 years, I would say we've begun to learn something about what a school ought to look like for kids um, in these pockets of excellence. And there are many, by the way, in district settings as well, at the school setting. Uh, I'm not aware of any variability in the 100 large urban school districts in this country, um, any meaningful lasting change at the district level in this country. But there are variations that arise by school. Um, and we, at least in our local setting, are beginning to learn about what it takes to remediate, genuinely prepare for college entry and success and ultimately economic mobility kids, and are just beginning, I think, to learn on the teacher prep side. So that's a little bit about the work I do as a practitioner with uh, my team at Match. Um, now, put all that aside, there's this open question about how will we learn what this work actually looks like to prepare teachers and to run schools. There's a completely separate phenomenon, which is, um, which I would, and this turns now to this question of government entanglement with this enterprise. So there are lots of places in our society where we solve problems that are as complex as the ones we're talking about today. Um, and to me, I've always had this instinct that um, things begin to struggle when the government in this country sets out to employ four million teachers. Recruit them, retain them, develop them, and pay them in teams that are incredibly fragile, um, that have to be well-led and organized, free of conflict, and that ultimately have to be learning organizations. There's nowhere else in our society where the government does that. Um, so the moment the government begins to actually micro-control, as it does in the case of conventional district settings, um, the teams, the professional teams that have to function, um, I get genuinely worried about whether they can do that. I know what it takes to assemble a group of teachers, motivate them, free them to do their work, compensate them in an effective way. And the school districts that we're talking about that run these schools are the most politicized, regulated, entrenched bureaucracies in our society. In other instances, when they set out to solve complex problems, like discover medicines or build complex missile systems, divide technology, they fund other organizations to do it. That's what, that's what we are now. We're a public agency. We're funded, but we're in no way unionized, regulated, or meddled with politically. So I actually have a shot at assembling a team that can learn. So there's a very open question about whether, while I'm a profound believer that the government should fund aggressively and equitably public school in this country, but genuinely ask yourself, can a city government, the most ossif one of the most ossified dysfunctional institutions of society, actually carry the load of, in the case of Boston, for example, 125 highly, highly functioning teams of professionals? It's a very genuine question. Um, and it is the norm in this country. There's very little public schooling activity but for that organizational setting. That's not a schooling question. That's a government reform, maybe a political science, maybe an organizational behavior question. Um, there's very little evidence in this country that the best practices, even where they do accumulate, can transfer into the status quo, <laughs> period. Um, 
there are surely knowledge deficits. In our case, we're studying teacher preparation and school design, but we do have, we are beginning to learn. There's very little evidence that the status quo can absorb it. I think it's for the reason I just described. Um, and I'll leave off with this. I think I work on the supply side. We're training, we're trying to produce knowledge, we're running schools. It's, um, it might be the case that we need one or both of the following two reforms in this country, neither of which is anywhere on the political horizon of Broadway. One is a total reformation of the role of city governments in the delivery of schooling. Um, there's an interesting thing going on in New Orleans right now. The government has been reduced in New Orleans in the course of the last 10 years after the hurricane hit to a single act of contracting. It does not, essentially, it is this thing that's now in vogue or been talked about in certain policy circles for a while, which is the true charter district, the portfolio management district, where the act of the city government is merely to allocate resources among schools based on their outputs and in no way form an opinion about how they do their job. I might get convinced that the politics and regulatory realities of city politics in this country can muster that much. By the way, there's no quality result yet in, in New Orleans, but at least there is a restructuring of government there that might be deep enough and opposite to the pathology I described a minute ago. The second one is this question of parent choice among public schools. 70% um, of kids in America today who go to public schools have chosen their public school because they're middle class or wealthier and can move. The only kids in this country who go to public schools who don't choose are the poor because they can't move. Urban school districts in this country have shrunk by half since the 1970s because anyone who could move has. So folks, let's keep this real. There is an enormous market for public school choice in this country. It's just not the province of the poor. And why is it the case that the poor can't choose among public schools? I, I believe the First Amendment prevents the government from funding private schools. I'm in no way in favor of that. But might there be mechanisms to unleash public choice among public schools because it would generate supply and more pressure on the system without triggering these fierce debates about um, the First Amendment? Um, and I think this system could benefit enormously from I'm thinking now of the years I've spent in Newark, New Jersey, and here in Boston, and various cities around the country. The city bureaucracies that control this delivery model could certainly benefit from any form of pressure and accountability. And the more we can get it on the parent choice side, um, I think the better. And it's also just plainly fair for poor parents to be able to shop among public schools, in my view. So back to India, my friends. I think um, I, I hope you take a very strong interest in the latter problem, which is um, the realities of government in India. I don't know the slightest bit about them, except I can safely assume they're severe. And the capacity of those organizations, the ones in question, to actually do complex work um, and to sustain uh, very, very complex teams that have to do complicated work. That's a different question than the knowledge gaps we're trying to fill. Um, that's it. Hi, my name's Parmeet the Day. Um, I work at the Ed School. And um, what you said, Stig, and also um, what's kind of been um, resonated across this panel is um, the importance of family engagement with outcomes for students and how um, when that's not there or when parents aren't empowered or communities aren't empowered, that can actually um, create problems yeah. and actually hinder students. Um, given um, what you know about, um, and this is for all panel members, um, what you know about um, family engagement here and what works, what kind of strategy, strategies do you think might work in India to empower parents and possibly increase the um, quality of education, especially for poor students? I'll go quickly on this. First, let me just amplify the diagnosis you're making. So Caroline Hoxby, formerly of Harvard, I think, did a meta study of all of this. And I think, to me at least, proved that something like 75% of the causality for any measure of an appropriate outcome for a kid um, originates in the family setting or in the adult relationships of that kid, as distinct from school variables, narrowly defined, and community variables. Um, so in other words, in shorthand, 
If you could want anything for a kid in this country, for sure, you'd want a home, a family, in quotation marks. We don't really know what it is in the home that's so profound. So that's a reality, and hence this constant conflict between schools and poverty, by the way, where families tend to under-function. Um, our response in this country is, you can't wait for poverty and health and employment outcomes, justice in its entirety, racism, all the ills of society to resolve. You just simply have to run schools that overwhelm all of that. With a very explicit idea that what we do at Match is maybe one-third schooling and two-thirds everything else. Um, that's this whole world of non-cognitive development in kids and causing them to be tenacious and, op for, and optimistic and to choose effort. Um, I recognize, therefore, that the schools we run are difficult to scale. Um, but in any case, that's, first of all, a genuine, honest, and courageous response was in the meantime, let's run schools that overwhelm the effects of poverty and under-functioning families. Um, IQ for that matter, too. Um, and then the other one is there's a thought that where parents can actually be activated to choose more. Remember, parents are much more capable in poor settings in this country than um, we think they are, and then they're allowed to be because they can't spend the money, they can't control the resources, let them choose. There's a lot of evidence, I think, that um, you could activate families if they could have more agency, uh, which middle class families have. So, um, so I would say run strong schools and give parents choice. Um. I would say a couple of complementary things. First of all, I would say that uh, it would be important for government to target more accurately the money spent on uh, supporting students to make it easier for poor families to keep their kids in school. There's lots of evidence that um, financial hardship is a factor, particularly if you have to travel distances to secondary school, you have to pay for hostels, you have to pay admission fees. Our evidence, for example, shows that a very small proportion of our champion girls make it to science or engineering schools because it, they're more expensive than the sort of more liberal arts schools. But of course, perversely, the liberal arts schools are much less likely to de deliver good employment, which promotes freedom <laughs> and mobility. So that's, that's a problem. Secondly, I would say, this is focusing on, on poor girls, that uh, really addressing gender and gender inequality and gender prejudice is critical to help parents who want to sort of try to challenge um, their communities and who, to help kids who want to challenge their communities do so. So I think that having, um, you know, human rights and gender uh, equal elements in the school curriculum and including the teachers and parents in that is, is really important. If you really want to ha make school accessible to the community, you have to be part, exactly as you just said, so you have to be part of what's going on in the broader community. And in India, this is particularly crucial. So you've got to really see yourself as, as part of this advocacy movement for the right to education for, for all kids and make it easier for parents uh, not to be outliers in their community, but to, to, to create a, a virtuous circle. So I would say those are two very important factors, financial investment and, if you like, ideological um, investment in, in a more gender equal approach. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments to your question. Um, I think Jackie's previous slide sort of said it all when you looked at the parents providing over 70% of the, of the support for a girl making it to college. Um, so that's a small sample set of India. I think if we take this question to a larger context, um, you know, Korean politicians live in fear of being um, called to the table for not providing excellent education for their children. So as a society, where does India stand in, in raising education to the top of the list? Um, concurrently, if I think about so much of the effort, again, here in the United States, um, perhaps shining a light into the pile and illuminating the facts is important. Um, groups like great schools that are putting up lots and lots of data about schools is, is, is channeling information to parents so they can make informed choices. Um, that's a lot of work, um, and I think in the Indian context, one of the things that we're trying to explore on this demand side question is how can we bring existing information, much of it which is produced in analog form, digital form, paper form, and it's all over the place, um, but bringing it together and beginning to create some marketplace for that information exchange to occur. Yeah, two questions. 
why is this specifically with regards to information? I, I know great schools is doing a good job, covers all the schools. <coughs> but what um, I've heard from them and from some others is that despite all the information <coughs> being available, parents still prefer a nice school, a safe school, over a school that delivers <coughs> academic results. And maybe that's, like Jackie said, that's, that's important too. Yeah. Um, and it's been hard to get parents to recognize that, you know, academics is really important for later success in life. Mm -hmm. So one is, have you seen, because it's one thing just to put the information up on a website, another thing to, to get parent behavior to actually change. Mm -hmm. so what have you seen in terms of small experiments that, where that has happened? Yeah. That's one. Yeah. Secondly, I think, you know, if, if any of you can comment on this, how, is there somewhere where sort of education has become an election issue and how does one make it into an election issue? In the U.S. In the U.S. Yeah. or elsewhere. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll hesitate in offering on the, fir on the second question. In the town of Lincoln where I live, education is often an election issue. Um, but to your point, Ashish, I don't, I don't know that in this country, from my perspective, we've been successful in raising it out of the local context to, um, to the national stage. I'll make a comment about your first, which is that I think it's too bad to contrast to have to have a sort of a, a dichotomy between quality outcomes educationally and, and safety. Many parents will tell you they don't send their daughters to school because they don't to secondary school because they don't think it's safe, and it turns out they're pretty accurate in that. So I think that's non-negotiable that school should be a safe place. It's a necessary condition of any academic performance. But beyond that, I would say that there is evidence, I think, from Brazil, amongst other places, that Parents, uh, you know, make wise choices. If the school delivers uh, resources which enable kids to flourish and to get good jobs and to improve their circumstances, then parents do make the sacrifices. If, on the other hand, school delivers nothing and kids are illiterate after four or five years, then why incur the opportunity cost? So I'm not so sure that it's a question of kind of you know, getting parents to see the light. I think it's a question of getting schools to deliver things which are valuable to poor families. A couple quick comments. Um, there, at the end of the line on this one, I think the libertarian in me takes over, and the, which says that if a mistake is going to be made about where a kid goes to school, the parent gets to make the mistake. The government shouldn't make the mistake. Right now, the prevailing situation in urban cities in this country is there are school assignment formulas and they are brutal. You're assigned to whatever is around the corner. Now, most of the situation you describe, Ashish, which is where parents hold on to a school that's quote unquote bad has arisen in this country around school closures. Distinguish that from the selection of schools. So yes, it is actually true. There are a few places where charter schools have been um, slated to get shut down and they're very, very strong community revolts around it. It's a complicated setting, situation, but it's sort of an edge case actually. Um, generally speaking, when parents go to choose schools where there are high quality schools around, they choose generally very intelligently. Now, here's a subtle thing, which is what is a good school and what's an educated kid? It's a complicated question. Um, you know, so I'm a huge fan of the standards movement in this country and measuring basic math and English skills in kids for lots and lots of reasons. It's also equally true that, because I think it turns out to condition schools to be better generally, often um, inadvertent or indirectly, and also it actually does predict higher order academic achievement, I think. Um, but ultimately, on the kind of softer measures of is this a place where my child will develop, um, Parents typically, I think, are actually very capable of choosing in this way. She's, and you know, where the schools are strong, so take Boston, which is probably the highest quality little charter school sector in the country, I mean, the waiting lists are extraordinary. Parents, it takes them very little time to sort this one out, I think. So I don't think the problem here is the capacity of parents to choose. In any case, that's the best possible problem we could have. Um, nor lack of information. It's simply a supply side question. It's the lack of quality options and I'm comfortable letting parents resolve, generally speaking, or at least have a huge hand and heavy hand in the definition of what that ought to be. Hi, uh, Raj Mundra from Andover. I'm really um, moved by your um, comments about power. 
um, between adults and children. And um, some of the best schools that I've seen in northern Pakistan and parts of India, there is a level of um, respect between the teachers and students. And um, how, do you, how do you encourage that in a school environment? You start with respecting the teachers. You start with including um, everybody. You know, I, I, you know, I wonder also in your uh, Champions Project whether um, you know, it was just resilience that kids and families had to overcome what was in the school, or was it a teacher? Was it the culture of their school? Um, and, and I also just think a lot about hope. And when there's that power dynamic, um, I think kids lose hope um, very quickly. Um, I just wanted your comments on that. Thank you. It's a great question for me. Um, the first thing I would say is there's some very practical things you can do. I think you need to enforce a prohibition on corporal punishment vigorously. That is not happening very widely in the world and certainly not happening in India. So corporal punishment is alive and kicking in, in Indian schools. And I think that is a, a, a radical human rights violation which government should take on straight away. So school should be a safe place and you shouldn't get hit or humiliated if you do something bad. You should find a more, teachers and school administrations need to find a more creative way of teaching kids what's appropriate behavior. So I think that's, a, again, I would say that's a necessary condition of learning. If you're frightened of being hit, if you give the wrong answer, or if you do something stupid, it, it completely undermines your ability to learn. So that, I think, is, and you know, you only need to spend a little time in Indian schools, as we have, to realize what a dominant issue that is. And of course, correlated with that, that all the questions of stigma, you know, the Harijan kids shouldn't sit in the back of the class, the girls shouldn't sit in the back of the class, you know, you should have rotation. I mean, simple questions of equity. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing I think is that you need to have a climate in which kids have a voice, even young children, so that they have a stake in the school, that they have a say over, you know, things like what uniform maybe, or the arrangement of the tables, or things where they actually have a stake in, 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 in making the day partly their own. And this might seem very soft compa compared to learning calculus or, you know, Latin, uh, but I think it's actually critical because it gives you, as, as you said, it not only a sense of hope, it gives you a sense of responsibility for the other kids. And for yourself. So I think these are really important fundamental issues about power and the distribution of power in schools, which we don't take seriously. I mean, my sense of, of spending time in Indian schools is that the it's like a military environment, you know, the, t the children have to kind of stand up, they recite in unison, the teachers shout orders. I mean, the environment is so contrary to anything that we would think would be pedagogically sort of um, enabling, that um, it's not surprising then that kids just sort of basically sit quietly and, and, and zone out often. So that, those are some of the most, most basic things I'd say. In terms of the Champions Project and our findings, you know, it's very complicated, it's multifactorial. I wouldn't want to give a simplistic answer to say, you know, there are these three things, you know, a loving mother, loving father, supportive teacher, though I think that all three of those are, are critical. Um, many different issues. Of course, there are psychosocial factors. Of course, there's just the kind of intelligence of the kid and, and her determination. Um, and of course, there's the kind of social status of the family. And of course, there are issues like having a mentor, having somebody who's provided an example to you. I mean, all those issues. But I think more fundamentally, in terms of things that we can impinge on, governments, and, and here I think probably we have some disagreement. I think government has a huge enormous role to play, and I think government's responsible for ensuring that even families that are uneducated don't have to make these onerous choices, but that they, school availability is, is sort of something that government takes responsibility for. Um, I think governments have a responsibility to make sure that they target much more carefully what we know to be enabling, which I'm not sure that is happening at the moment. So I think we're looking at, at some successes. We're looking at you know how many kids you get into an IIT or an IIM, and how many kids you get somewhere rather than looking at, you know, how you, how you create a, 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 a all ships rising situation. So I think the ethics 
of Indian schools are fundamentally flawed in many ways. And of course, if you go to the elite schools that some people mention, Cathedral, Campion, and so on, you find a much more egalitarian environment. I mean, you, you find a much more, at least as far as I'm aware, there's no corporal punishment. There's, no, there's none of this kind of shouting abuse in the classroom in the same way. So uh, there may be, I may be wrong about that in some schools, but my sense is that, is that um, the sorts of things that we as privileged parents expect for our children should be the same as what we expect for, for less privileged children. Hi, my question is also for Professor Baba. Uh, given your interest uh, and strong focus in equity, I'm really interested in uh, knowing what's your stance and where your take on this ongoing debate around uh, choice and whether poor parents should have the choice to take a voucher and send their children to private schools. Based on your work uh, in India, do you think these girls uh, would benefit if they had a voucher to go to a private school? Would that make their life better? Uh, and what's your in uh, take on that entire debate? So there are people in this room who know much more about this than I do. I should just tell you that my fairly uninformed uh, position is that I'm in favor of public and state education. Um, and I think that um, families that don't have financial resources to invest in schools should have the opportunity to have excellent schools. I mean, if you think of, and again, I'm not an education expert, but my sense is that in Germany, and I went to school in Italy, you know, nobody went, goes to private school unless you're going into the nunnery or something, which I wasn't. <laughs> um, so, you know, s state schools are the best schools. Um, and the kids who perhaps are not so able, or who maybe have learning disabilities, go to private schools. Um, you know, it's, it's it's a mark of pride. Those, those are the, the best teachers go to public, to state schools. And frankly, there's not that much choice because you go to the local school um, and there's a value in knowing your peers. There's a value in walking to school together. It's safer, it's nicer. You have school friends in your community. So this whole kind of American, maybe not only American, English too, kind of question of choice which preoccupies us so much is, is of course a function of the fact that there are these enormous disparities in schools. So parents who know better push or even will buy houses in, in public school districts where they know the schools are good. And that's, you know, that's a, a function of a, of a misaligned market. So um, I guess I, our project is more interested in enabling, you know, rural girls, the 6%, more of them to get to uh, secondary school and to college so that they have the freedom to get a good job and be safe and, and, and uh, prosperous. And I'm not sure that private schools are going to play a big part in that. But uh, I know this is a, I, I, I'm not really an expert on that topic. Um, at, the, at the risk of being a, a disruptive comment, maybe, uh, I mean, I'm just reading the description of the panel, which says that, which makes the claim that there's a lot to learn for India from the United States experience. Uh, and as I'm listening to the comments, I'm wondering how true that is. Uh, because the contextual circumstances are so completely different, uh, not at the level of basics. Of course, we all want uh, fairness and equity, and we want our kids to learn to think, and we want them to be able to do the basic things. But at the way that that, that reality manifests itself on Monday morning, I mean, just as an example, um, I mean, the proposition that the government would be able to enforce some of the things we want to enforce in India in the near future I just find it very hard to imagine how that would work, Jackie, or or how we would replicate the Italian experience with the good teachers going to the public schools after listening to what Abhijit and others were saying earlier about the state of the school. It's a question of how we get there. Whatever whatever our idealized counterfactual might be, we'd like to get there, and the question is how do we get from here to there? If I hear Stig saying, I, I, I'm gonna put words in your mouth and you can correct me, I don't know that he's opposed to the idea of government, but actually, no, you were. You said you're a libertarian, so you are. No, 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 I'm not a libertarian. No, no, no. You said, you said I'm a libertarian. <laughs> I'm Danish, man. I'm not even close to libertarian. But <laughs> so it's you know whatever it is, how do we get from here to there? And you know, I, I heard you saying, uh, I heard you saying that this is the best path to go given where we are. Here's what I'm saying. So I'll, I'll make this an anecdote. Uh, sorry, it's rambling. I'm trying to make a conversation. I, spent, I have to spend four years of my life in Newark, New Jersey. Okay? Newark, New Jersey, every mayor in Newark, I grew up down there, gone to jail for the last 40 years. It is a genuine, it is a city where democracy has broken down. Okay? It's one of the poorest cities in this country. Nobody votes. 
political machines control and rob that city. That's a fact. They spend $23,000 a year in city government delivering schooling that has almost no, and the schooling were you to go look at it, we would find dismal. Moreover, the government in Newark, this city, is a dysfunctional place, okay? So my point was merely that we need, in urban settings in this country, and, I'm, and this is unique to urban settings, because in suburban America, middle-class America, these issues tend to fade away, actually. But the question I'm putting on the table is, can we, in a non-naive way, believe that Oakland and Detroit and Chicago and Newark, places where Democracy does not function very well where, there's, where city governments are either at a minimal dysfunctional, patronage driven, and at worst flat out corrupt many times. Can they really go out and do what we do every day at Match, which requires us to recruit people who are every bit as skilled as you guys? Uh, what I have to do to run our schools does not tolerate meddling politically through regulation. I mean, this is comp these are complicated teams. So I'm profoundly in favor of the government funding public school in this country. It's a law. The Massachusetts state constitution requires it. I'm completely in favor of the government regulating it, measuring it, demanding the outcomes. The thing I'm questioning is whether city governments in 100 urban settings in this country can employ the 75,000 teachers, 750,000 teachers, let's say, who school, let's call it the 15 million kids who go to dysfunctional schools. And what if instead they were to fund it and measure it, but let other entities, organizations that actually can function, like us, we're a nonprofit. Look, the government funds research. I bet they pay for half the PowerPoints I saw today. They don't employ the economists, right? <laughs> right? So in other words, where else in our society are we optimistic about the government? Actually, they don't, they don't right? So that's my question. Now I'll get back to India, which is, what is the role of the government in it? I can't think this one through, but. You are a libertarian. <laughs> right. Uh, Jackie, I know you have experience uh, working in India, but I think this notion of creating an Italian like model in India is totally unrealistic. First of all, when the cat's out of the bag, when 35% of kids are already going to private school, I send my kids to private school. Every, I mean, I told you, 70% of government school teachers send their kids to private school. Are you now going to force these people to send their kids back to government? It's, it's impossible. In fact, the private share is winning market sh private sector is winning market share at the rate of one to two percentage points per year. And it's quite possible that in 15 years, 60% of Indian kids go to private school. It's actually more likely to, to, to turn out completely different, like Stieg's model. In fact, in urban settings, in Bombay, 75% of kids already go to private school. And it's quite possible, we looked at the Bombay school system, in the last 10 years, student count has declined 35%, whilst the city's population has gone up by 40 to 50%. And so nothing tells me that it's going to be very different for the next 10 years. So it's quite possible that the India model is more like what Stig is saying, which is, and it, it's not that the government wants to let go of it, they just do such a horrible job that market forces are completely taking over. Um, I, I don't know enough about this. I'm not really advocating an Italian model as such. What I, um, that was, my point was simply that if there are good choices, you know, this whole question of choice really becomes redundant. And that's, that obviously is an ideal state. Um, I, I think that there are also fashions in, in these things. Pa parents follow other parents. I'm not sure that many, I, I, I spent some time in January in a very, very poor family. She's a, a street vendor and she sends her two boys to private school. She has no money at all. She sends two boys to private school and her daughter goes to state school. They're all getting the same education. It's just like, you know, that in other words, they're not really learning anything. I mean, so it's, it's whether it's, so, you know, I, and I'm not a business person, so I don't really know enough about market choice. I don't know what makes all these parents switch. My impression, I thought one of our uh, previous panelists said that the jury's out on whether the education from private schools is better. It may be that people are voting with their feet, but people are also uh, drinking Coca-Cola and smoking cigarettes and doing all sorts of things that are bad for them. So the fact that parents are making these choices doesn't necessarily mean that they're good choices. Now, uh, you know, you can tell that I'm not a business school person. But... Um, 
I, I guess, you know, and I'm aware, and as I'm sure you are, I know, you know, I've seen visited Muktangda and, and other programs, which I know you're aware of, who are doing wonderful work in the municipal schools. A kid who goes to one of the Muktangda schools is going to do a dance site better than a kid who goes to one of those private schools where they're spending 10, you know, whatever it is, 100 rupees a month. So um, I'm not sure that parental choice always correlates with quality. It doesn't mean that you should prevent the parents making those choices, but... I'm wondering whether this sense of inevitability that private is the way to go is, um, is, is, is correct. And whether, you know, I mean, whether there are ways in which this whole discussion may be still um, changeable. But this is something I, I need to think about more. I want to check one quick fact on this. Just um, this is fascinating to me. Remember, just in the American context, there's very, there's very little private schooling in this country. 10% of school age kids go to private schools, parochial schools and some high, very expensive independent schools. Put that to the side. The 90% of the 50 million kids in this country that go to, to school at K to 12, they go to public schools. There's this often overlooked but extraordinary piece of evidence on this question, which is that there's been, wherever parents can shop among public schools through residential choice, that's exactly what they do. So just pointing that out, this country, it's probably illegal for the government in any serious way to fund private schooling. That's the First Amendment, church and state. But there is a thriving market for public school choice in this country, out of which is locked poor, the poor family, merely because they're trapped in the 100 big urban school districts. And so that's merely the, the point that I would love to unleash, because it's almost impossible to look a poor parent in the eye and say, hey, look around your neighborhood in Dorchester. Every single middle class family now either goes to parochial school or they're sending it, they moved. And you know what, but we got good news for you. We're going to send you to a district school, which hasn't gotten better in 40 years. Because we, you know, it's impossible, in my view, to look at poor parent in the eye and say they, and by the way, the government's spending $22,000 a year to run that public school to your dismay. But, you know, so this is where public school choice, that's not vouchers exactly. But anyhow. And see, the, 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 the challenge yeah. to put up there is that of the 5,000 chartered schools, yeah. you, I think, said 300 are superb and, and, and outperforming. So within this cohort yeah. of outside the system, there's a pretty large sea of mediocrity, and, and one might even say, right. you know. And here's why, Tom. Here's what went wrong wrong in a charter school movement in this country. That, in my view, beautifully deregulated the micro, the micro organizational behavior realities. I run a school, it's decentralized, there's no political meddling, I'm not my, wildly regulated, I'm not gummed up in you. I can run this thing like, you know, I can actually really try to build it. Um, and so 6,000 charter schools got started in this country over the last 15 years. It does not actually surprise me that 90% of them weren't very good. You open up 6,000 of anything that's complicated, restaurants or software <laughs> firms, it, the failure rates ought to be high. This is hard to do. What, what, what the movement failed to do was for the authorizers, which in this country are mostly the state agencies, to come back and shut down the schools. It has a lot to do with what she's just described, which is, again, democracy mal misfires here, which is it is never in a politician's interest elected or appointed to shut down a school. And so it was, again, a question of exit. The government failed to, re to allocate resources intelligently. If they could have done that swiftly, for one thing, we would have grown faster, and you would have had this effect that we're chasing that's so wildly absent, which is the allocation across schools and among schools to the ones that function, right? The charter movement genuinely has failed on that. They very rarely are they closed. And so as a result, they're allowed to move on. And, and the movement sort of stalled in that regard. There's a, there are 300 very interesting national assets in the movement that I think, like us, are learning. Right. But, okay. One, uh, one last in the last uh, comment you made, you said, you know, the title of this panel is, can we learn certain things from the United States, uh, the educational movement in the United States? I think one thing we've not talked about, which has been very interesting, is the uh, Education Administration uh, for Obama has started early Head Start programs. Right, which is they're providing centrally and state-funded um, access for young children, zero to three, to go to early childhood education programs. Uh, Philippe talked about it at the end of his panel. I think, Tom, you talked about it, the power of early childhood education. Now, when you apply it to the Indian context, we've, we've, the government has passed Right to Education Act, but it started it from six years old, which is from primary one. So they consciously said, no, we, we think from primary one, we want children to be in schools, and for a whole host of implementation reasons probably, they've chosen not to do that from, for early childhood education. Mm. And the question I had 
Tom, I know that you and Ashish have been speaking to the government and looking at um, certain conversations around improving primary schools. Have you had any conversation or do you have any sense how they think about providing the younger, providing you know, education in the earlier years? Ashish, do you have anything? I, I don't have information on this. Uh, I think there's several people talking about uh, you know, lowering the age for compulsory schooling in India, maybe possibly starting at age four. The issue is uh, money, of course, partly. Um, we already spend about 11% of the total budget on education, and most states in India spend 15 to 20% of their budget on education. So you don't have a lot of fiscal space, and we already run a large budget, budget deficit. But I, you know, there are definitely people pushing for compulsory education to be, to be brought down to age four at least to start with. If I can just add, uh, the Women and Child Development Ministry, that is responsible for the education of the children between, for preschool education, and children between zero to six years. And thereafter, it's the Ministry of Human Resource Development. So historically, there's been a turf sort of between these two ministries, and they haven't really looked at preschool education as a component of the Ministry of Education's work. It's only like Ashish saying the work of you know activists and people campaigning that you know this needs to be included. It's big; people are beginning to think about it. But in my sense, it's unrealistic given the amount of funds it requires uh, that the Indian government is going to pursue this in the immediate future. Um, we are. Uh time. Uh, the, the, uh, the image that I'm so struck with is it would be nice if, uh, and I want to combine two comments. One is, you know, some of the comments about interesting experiments that are working in pockets. They might be state-run schools in particular environmental circumstances. They might be charter schools. And then the idea of creating some sort of a groundswell to amplify this. I think somebody, maybe it was Ashish or somebody said, is there any place where it's become an election issue. That, to me, is a way of creating a groundswell. Um, so that's the image that I'm left with saying, I don't quite see where the front of this elephant is, Tom, but if there is a way to find pockets of excellence in any ambience and then find ways to amplify those little pockets and have the shutting down, so this is getting to be a wish list, right? Mm -hmm. I want the experiments, I want the amplifying, mm -hmm. and I want the shutting down. But those are the three attributes that it seems like if we go after, that's got to be the basic recipe for something that can done, get done in a context where state capacity is fairly limited and will be limited for some time. I'm talking about India, yeah. uh, let alone Newark, uh, New Jersey. <laughs> so uh, what, uh, please join me in thanking the panelists. Yeah. I think we have a reception right outside, so please join us. Uh, yeah. Thank you.